Hey, it's Dev yet again, and I'm here to talk about um, what I'm using on this Lightwork European Tour. Um, my main guitar is this guy, and it's a frame of Stormbender, and it has the uh, Dick extension lights on it, which is great for me in particular, and Martin as well, I believe. Um, it was, right? Yeah. So basically, this is um, a custom version of the guitar that we've developed together with Framus, and it's uh, this particular one, mahogany body, maple top, um, but it has a Koa middle, 25, 12, 25 and a half inch scale, Strat scale, ebony fretboard, Evertune, uh, Fishman uh, Transcendence pickups, which are the pickups that I developed with them, which um, have essentially two tones that I use primarily. It's in the main position, it's a very uh, akin to an EMG 81, but with a voice that I developed with them, so it's more uh, unique, I guess, to this pickup. And then in this position, middle here, it sort of turns these two into a low gain single coil sound that has a boost for the output so they don't drop in volume compared to the humbucker setting. And I use that for a, a sort of a girthy, clean tone, I guess. Uh, it's the... What, who makes this? I can't even see. Grover makes these. And I've got the Grover tuners on all of them. However, we chose to put these particular ones on this guitar, and none of us <laughs> like those because they have a weird locking thing. But the actual Grover tuners themselves, are I love them. Uh, and that's it. So the guitar itself... Uh, has been dropped only a couple of times but the thing that I really like about these guitars above and beyond the fact that they're great fun to play and they sound amazing is that they really take a beating well and as uh, uh, maybe not in the beating part but in terms of uh, the ability to work with things that aren't fragile for long periods of time uh, I guess <laughs> my wife would attest to that Sorry, Chase. No beating, though. It's the other way around, man. So that's this one. And uh, I use the the uh, locking thingamabobs because, again, my tendency to drop things is omnipresent. It's got... Uh, one of the cool little thing here is the little um, input jack bum hole there is pretty cool. It's a pain in the ass to change, though, if it breaks. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, it's there in case you... It protects the entire shaft. It protects, it protects the entire shaft. That speed wipe. <laughs> Heron speed wipe. If you don't have time to do the paperwork. So this is a seven spring version. Um, main difference with this and a lot of other seven strings... Actually, I don't know too much what the scale length on other seven strings are. But uh, this is 26, so it's a little shorter. And this has got the carbon fiber in the middle, which is basically what the uh, stock Stormbender look is. It's uh, mahogany body, maple top, carbon fiber middle. This is a seven string version of the Transcendence pickup that I believe was a prototype. Um, and it's got the same functionality. And uh, yeah, essentially this is, this is the same guitar with just a wider fretboard and the 26 inch scale. And they got these little dinky versions of the Grover tuners there, which don't feel nearly as, as groovy to me. But otherwise, we'd have a boat oar for a headstock. So dinky it is. Speed white. Woo! What do we got here? What do we got here, bud? Michael. Oh, yeah, Mike. The other guitar player on the Lightwork tour is Sir Michael Keneally. Lord Cronus, Man About Town, and this guitar, um, wow, look at that. This guitar, Framus had originally made for me for the Transcendence album, um, but Mike and I worked together on the Empath record and are now back in each other's worlds, and so I gave this one to him because we play together so often, and it's great to have Framus represented there as well. Uh, and this is based on their Mayfield body style, 
except much to their chagrin, I asked them to make it solid body. The Mayfield is actually is semi hollow, so this weighs uh, a fair amount. Yeah. <laughs> But I like it. I like the. I like the. There's something about the fact that it's heavy that makes me feel like it sounds heavier, which is probably not true. But you have to understand, I uh, am old and simple, and the combination of those two things means heavier equals heavy. And it has white lights, right light, and a round thing on the 12th fret, which is indicative of other round things like donuts, or rings, or. Input jacks. Did you sleep last night? You did. Hey, I didn't. Yay. I feel like we know what we're doing. And in purple. Martin and I pretend that the dynamic between us is this, but then when we're off stage, the pants are worn by him. <laughs> by a huge Martin. More resilient than I. I cry easily. Ouch. Speed wipe. All right, so this one here is a, um, I guess that's some sort of crazy burl thing. I had asked for a brown guitar, and this was for, I think this was... That's quite old now, right? Yeah, like we had said in the interview, bam! Like we had said in the interview view earlier, um, one of my favorite things about the arrangement that I've had with Famous over the years is that they make a guitar per album cycle, so we kind of... Um, design the guitars based on what that album cycle feels like to me. I believe this one was during um, Epic Cloud. Yeah, and so I'd asked for something brown, and they chose this kind of pockmarked finish, um, which is cool, actually. And at first, I was sort of not on the fence about this guitar, but because it's semi-hollow, I thought it wouldn't sound as, as heavy. But uh, we put my pickups into it, and uh, yeah, this is a cool sounding guitar, actually. I really like it. Um, I find that this is one of those guitars that, like the back of it's really pretty with the flame there. It's one of those guitars that I don't think I like as much until I play it, and then I realize how much I actually like it. So that's perhaps not the ringing, most ringing endorsement, but, but it's pretty groovy. I put these on myself. Hey. Because I'm a guitar builder, right? And uh, they're off-center, so that says a lot about that, too. All right, so... Is that it? That's what we're famous for? Yeah, so I, I've got a couple other guitars on the run, like I mentioned before. For the headless guitars, I use the Kiesel stuff, and uh, I talked to Framus, and they let me use an Aristides Tele, because I think it's beautiful as well. Um, and uh, because this is... Yeah, one of the main things that I did with with um, with one of the main reasons why I love working with Framus so much is I do an ambient project and I really love the idea of the headless guitars, and so I started working with Kiesel, and they, um, uh, you know, I said I don't want to leave Framus because I love what they've done and I love using the guitars, so I contacted Hans Peter and I said. Would it be okay if for headless guitars and for my ambient work I work with, with Kiesel? And, and he gave us okay for that. And that was another one of the reasons why I love working with Framus as much as I do because I think it looks so cheesy when people use things and then pretend like the last relationship they had didn't mean anything to them. So I use both of these companies' guitars. And that's maybe a little unique in this world that I'm in, but... Uh, but at least you know the endorsement makes sense to me. I love these guitars and I use them for the ambient stuff as well. And then um, I had actually contacted him as well about um, I love Telecasters and uh, for, for the encore I use this Aristides guitar. Oh my god. Oh my god. Everything's stuck, buddy. <laughs> Time to go home. Uh, Aristides made me a couple of these Telecasters, and I just love them. I think they're fucking awesome, and they're just so interesting, because I love Telecasters. Framus doesn't make a Telecaster. I love Telecasters, and uh, I got the okay to use this one, and uh, 
Aristides makes really, really, really cool stuff. It's so, like, the attention to detail and the OCD that goes into it really um, appeals to me because it's not made out of wood. It's made out of a, a kind of injection-molded goo. <laughs> yeah, it's like resin. Like raisins. Thanks, buddy. See? We make it look like this dynamic happens all the time. <laughs> like, yeah, man. Can you do that for me, bud? <laughs> right? Well, otherwise, I've... This makes my day harder. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Stay away. It's like me putting knobs on it's things. It's easier when you stay away. <laughs> I know. That's <laughs> another thing that goes back to my relationships in general. It's like, I like you, man. Just If you could just fuck off, that'd be awesome. Um, so, uh, what else did we see here? Uh, you've got your M half keys. Oh, yeah. These, these are the sparrows. Yeah, those are James's. James, yeah, his bass is a nice I work with a Vancouver company for my uh, acoustic guitar. This is company based out of Vancouver, like I just said, Prestige Guitars, and uh, I wanted to work with them. This is the Empath uh, signature, yay, uh, and this is a beautiful guitar, Adirondack Spruce, with the mahogany and the cutaways, and little Canadian maple flag there, just, you know, I'm a Canuck, and I liked uh, being able to work with a local company, and this is a, a wonderful guitar, and um, yeah, that's really groovy. Yeah. Completely interesting. Oh, gosh, I almost forgot. I didn't. All right, so for amplifiers, um, said crossing his legs elegantly. <laughs> amplifiers. Amplifiers. You know, I've always thought that it's interesting how you can, you're allowed to say that your favorite amp in the world is, is like a Dumble or something. You know, or like a 1971 Super Bass 100, but with a certain type of cap. Um, but my favorite amps are digital. I think they're fucking awesome. And uh, I write my records with the Axe Effects and have for many years. Uh, I've got their Axe Edit up on one screen while I'm in the studio. So as I'm writing, I... Or composing. It's even better. I... Uh, make sounds that go along with the songs and so when I come to play live I've got the exact same sounds and I use uh, I shoot my own IR cabinets for them because if you use digital you'll probably agree that scrolling through 9,000 cabs is just a total pain in the sack so I make my own I just found an old cab and then I ran through it was an old Marshall something and uh, and it sounds killer to me and so all these basically I've this one I've got this is from my studio the spare and then these two I just keep in Europe one of them's Mike's one of them's mine and this third one here is uh, so they're all identical the A patch is all my patches B patch is all Mike's patches and then this one is just a, a redundancy that we fortunately not have had to use yet but the Axe FX is just, it's just such an amazing piece of gear, man. It's like, again, you're not allowed to say that, <laughs> it seems. But as somebody who loves the idea of sound and being able to manipulate things and effects and, and all this, to be able to create my sounds in the studio with unlimited, uh, unlimited creative freedom. Basically, the, the editor, when you open up these Axe FX, are basic it's just it's like a blank slate that then I can say okay I want to put a wah in front of a certain type of amp then I'll have a cab and I'll split the signal after the wah that then goes into an effects chain that in another scene it mutes the input of that effects chain and then engages a rotary on another and then and fortunately I never had to do that thing where I toured with a 20 space rack full of you know, H3000s and ADAs and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it was super romantic in the 80s to think that one day maybe I would do that. But for me, uh, this it's my favorite amp. I love these things, man. I just love them. And I, uh, but in the same way that I've been fortunate enough to work with different guitar companies, um, I work with different digital amp companies too. And the reason for that is because they do something different for me. And it's really important for me that when I endorse a product, it's because I think it's killer. And the Axfex is amazing. It's amazing. But I also love uh, 
uh, the Line 6 Helix. I think it's... But I don't use it for the same thing. So on the tour here, um, I guess it's over there right now. Yeah, it's all rigged up. So on the stage, uh, in the beginning of the show, I do a ambient uh, intro. And as I said before, I, I use the, the headless guitars for the ambient stuff. And so I plug this into two Line 6 Helix floors, like they're floorboard units. And I create um, this, thanks buddy, the ambient sounds <laughs> with that. And the reason why I use that instead of the Axe effects uh, is, I mean, it's, it seems like, it seems like, you know, it, it, can the Axe effects do all that? Absolutely. It's, Axe effects can do anything, man. This thing is an incredible powerhouse. But the Line 6, they created their floorboard in a way that was just so fun. <laughs> it's so much fun, man. It's like all the updates with the echoes and everything make it so that it's such a uh, like fun tactile experience for me that I really love using that and have chosen to use that for the ambient stuff um, for the recording and for the real power that I need to do the live set uh, the Axe FX is just it's, it's the one for me but for the ambient intro and for just the fact that I love using it I think it's a super cool thing Line 6 Helix Floor is, is what I use for that. When it comes to how we do patch changes, everything is done through MIDI. So uh, the drummer, Darby, has got a Cymatic um, uh, LP16. We've got two of them. One is a redundancy. In the same way we have this as a redundancy. And we run... Uh, when I'm programming the sounds at home, like I'll run the set and then on the... the the beat that I want to change to these different scenes. So maybe one of them's got an overdrive, one of them's got a bypass delay, maybe one of them has a chorus or a synth or something. But at home prior to the tour, I run the click tracks and then I just take the USB out of my main computer and plug the USB into this Axe FX. And then I make uh, like um, an individual instance of a MIDI channel in Pro Tools that sends a program change for the actual patches. So basically in the beginning of maybe Lightworker, the, the song Lightworker, it'll send um, a patch, a, a program change 44 that will then send this to patch 44. And then within that, you can assign a CC uh, to a continuous controller to change the actual scene. So within every preset in the Axe Effects, you've got eight scenes, which is essentially like eight different variations of that theme. And so, for example, on this one, I've got like a dry uh, GP, which is my sort of echo sound, the mid sound, which is like quieter, and then even quieter. There's the intro, there's a chorus and chorus, chorus solo. And then I go through all the work at home and set up those CC changes so that on the beat, they, they change. And then every time we back up all this stuff, like I've got one of these in Australia, got it in North America, and wherever we go, I just go with the USB stick, and then it all kind of, as long as you've got a redundancy, because the chances of these things going down is basically 100%, not the Axe FX, but just problems happen, right? So, but to be able to just kind of migrate all that work and then constantly update your sounds over time, means that a lot of the work that I play with on this run is stuff that I've been developing for like a decade, more so than, more than that with the Axe FX. And I love that. It's my favorite gear, man. I love using digital stuff. I, I do appreciate... Well, here's another thing I was going to say about digital that, that is maybe gives credence to why for me it works. Um, if you... If you plug in, a, again, a 1971 Super Bass 100, uh, my friend's got a Marshall, and it's, a, it's incredible sounding in. But the tonal footprint of it is so large that for music like I write, where there's a lot of orchestration, like we have choirs and orchestras and multiple vocals and guitars doing harmonic lines and, and all these things, basically there's very little real estate in a stereo spectrum for a guitar sound to exist. So on Empath and Lightwork, we had experience, specifically on Empath, we set up 
12 different cabinets. We had like Bogners and EVH and old Marshalls and Mesa boogies and pedal boards and all that stuff that, that when, you, when you're out there and it's flapping your pant legs when you're playing really heavy, it's a super gratifying sound. But in the framework of the music that I write, the sonic footprint was too big. And one would say, well, how can you make, how can it be too big? That might imply that it sounds too good. But really, if you've got a, a, a frequency spectrum that you're working with where the symbols exist wherever it is, like 5 to 16K, and the guitars basically exist somewhere between 100 and, and maybe 5K, and then in that mid-range where you've got to fit everything, like below that 100, you've got to get the bass, and then below that you've got the kick, but each one of those frequency ranges it sort of extends into each other. The cymbals, the orchestra, and like specifically the brass, the brass exists in a very similar frequency range to where the guitar doing distorted stuff exists, as well as the china cymbal. And if you have a synth, like say you have a Moog or you have a, a Triton or something, a lot of that sort of harmonic content that exists in the mid-range there also exists in the same place as the fundamental of the guitar. So while I'm mixing and while I'm working, I've got an instance of a frequency analysis in front of me so that when I solo instruments, I can see where they're taking up space. And a lot of how I fit heavy guitars into such a dense mix is often just with high and low pass. Like I'll just um, cut everything below 100 and then everything maybe above 12. And that leaves this sonic uh, footprint of a guitar sound that if a lot of what makes that frequency range with a real amp sound so impressive exists kind of outside of that in a way, or even with the notches that I have to put into the frequency in order to fit the cymbals and in order to fit the brass and in order to fit my vocals, which has a crazy spike at like 3.5K, it's uh, by the end of it, you're left with this awful guitar sound. So the thing that works so good for me with digital is I can take basically, it's almost like you can fit a bigger sound into a smaller footprint because it's like a, not a photocopy of a sound, but in a sense it's like you can get a full range sound in a smaller footprint. And when I try and do that with, with an actual amplifier, I just, I, I basically I end up with all this reedy sounding mid-range that I'm trying to fit in. And then on top of that, I, I, I don't have the effects and without the noise gates and all this. So my decision to end up with digital isn't coming from a place of, of um, it's better than the other thing, but it's better for me. And I think that as a player, those are the decisions that you have to really uh, come to have some degree of peace with, right? So uh, the people who love the real amps, um, it's probably because what they're writing, it makes more sense for them. But after exhaustively experimenting with them, I find, for me, that this works well for me, because the guitar plays a, a role in the composition more so than it being a feature, right? I, I think it's like bringing, uh, knowing you, the studio guitar environment to the stage. Yeah. In sense, you, know, you have more control over it. What does Architects use? They use the same thing? Or? Quad Cortex, that's the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like the Quad Cortex too. I'm, I'm actually doing a, I'm doing a, uh, uh, a uh, archetype with Neural DSP. Yeah. And uh, they sent the Quad Cortex as well. And I really like it. But I, I didn't find that I, I gelled with it as well as, as those two things. Yeah. But the thing I loved about the Quad Cortex is the looper. I think that's yeah, fucking... Yeah, the looper is amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, mean, I, I was a fan of the digital even before we met, you know, and uh, I love all of them for different reasons. Totally. You're the only person I've worked with with a fractal. Yeah. And I, you, you lent me that one for like a year <laughs> during the pandemic. Yeah, and, man. And yeah, it was every day was learning something new about it. And 
It's the, great. The it's, tuner's killer too. The tune is amazing. Yeah. And the, the thing you missed, I think, is is daily consistency. Yeah, for, I think for, so. for yourself I think and so. for monitors and for front of house. Well, we're in we're in just, uh, we do uh, in ear monitors too, right? So we don't have like uh, the throw off stage and everything. And so for me, knowing that it's going to sound similar in my ear every night is really cool. But I also, you know, it's funny, like you say, with with each piece of gear, it's so specific. And uh, again, I love being able to, again, this is another thing I'll say about Framus that I love so much. I use Framus guitars with the, because I love them, but I also love the fact that when I came to them and said, I also love using that Kiesel guitar for the ambient stuff, they're like, okay. You know what I mean? It was like super important to me because then we don't have to lie and say, oh, this and that and the other thing. And in the same way, when I was at home prior to the setup for the uh, ambient rig with the Line 6, because I love the looper in the quad cortex so much, I made a I made a, a an effects loop block yeah. in the line six and then ran, <laughs> yeah, and then I had in the quad and so then I had all the stuff going into the quad and I just used it for a looper and then I had a bunch of filters because I love the little rotaries on it, but then by the end of it I had all these fucking cables yeah and it was just it was I hated it yeah so so. Um, but yeah, the quad cortex is an amazing piece of gear as well. I think really it comes down to figuring out what it is that you want to achieve and then finding the tools for the job that facilitate that. And all these are incredible tools, man. But these are the ones that I've chosen. So. And they work. Yeah. Oh, I use um, picks. <laughs> Wait, I got one. I got one. Oh, that's a wood one. Hey, somebody gave me this Ohm picks in Finland, and they're really cool, actually. I didn't think I'd like it, but I like it. They're made out of wood. Um, OHM picks. He's done up. Yeah, these were beeves, though. Beeves. <laughs> yeah, this is... Got loads, yeah, I know, but this is the one. I got this, right? Yeah. So this is... Uh, I, I've always liked the Pizza Slice picks, .88. Um, tortilla chips. Tortilla chips, yeah. and they're uh, Dunlop. Um, but I actually have just... Uh, over the past year I've been developing a pick with Acoustic Attack which is specific to a certain thing I've been trying to achieve for years and, and we're at the point where we're in the prototype area with it but um, that I think I measured is around the same thickness as that this one here? that's mine yeah. yeah which is an 8 egg, I think so they're basically it's a little bit of gift but I mean picks are so I mean oops <laughs> I um I uh, uh, I, yeah, yeah. I like the Altex, but they shred too fast for me. I like the Tortex, but they don't sound as crisp as the Altex. But um, now I'm working with this other one, and it should be better than both. Or either that, or it will be not as good as either. But at that point, I'm too far in that I'll probably pretend that it's a killer. Um, they are really cool, though, but they're not done yet. So the last thing I'll say is the, uh, the Fishman pickup. So the Transcendence pickups here... Um, they're, uh, I don't know what the technical way they do it, it's a bunch of circuit boards that are uh, printed vertically that allow them to have a certain amount of consistency. So when I went to Boston and I worked on the, the tone with these, um, technically I guess they're all meant to be uh, exactly the same and I actually really like the pickups, I've been using them for years. But what's really cool is this, um, this setup, so this is just an example of the Aristides, but essentially uh, they're active pickups but you can charge them by USB. So as opposed to just turfing 9-volt batteries every day, which we still do, to be honest, because fuck you, Earth. The, um, this here uh, allows you to um, sort of cut down on that. They charge super quick. And they charge super quick, yeah. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, all my patch changes are done via MIDI from the Cymatics. Uh, and for the wireless unit, we're just using a little cheap... Um, the Shore DX60? Something. Maybe. Yeah, and it works. It's it's a board one. Seems it works. okay, yeah. It works really well. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we do, guys. Oh, a Diderio 1052 strings since I was like one. Um, for every tuning. As for well. every tuning, yeah. yeah. It's almost like I've gotten used to what 1052 feels like in standard, and I expect a standard guitar to feel like that. And then I expect it to feel like. 1052 does in C, and I, you know, so I equate the slinkiness of 1052 and B to what it's like to play in B, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's the advantage of the Evertune as well. Oh, shit. <laughs> Evertune. Uh, 
is made by wizards high atop a, a craggy cliff. A guitar mountain. A guitar mountain populated <laughs> only by the most okay, elegant of, of human beings known as Cosmos. If there is ever a human being that deserved to be called Cosmos, it's the guy who created Evertune. And he nearly got me beat up at a bar one night. So, um, yeah. And the best thing about him is I think he was a physics student that didn't know how to play guitar and went to a blues jam and everybody was out of tune. He was like, I have a solution for this. And the Evertune is, I love it so much. It's like training wheels for people who are uh, competent musically and that's the extent of it. That's not the best selling point. Uh, they're awesome. Hey guys, thank you so much. This is Martin, and Hello. and he puts up with with uh, uh, everybody. <laughs> so, and that's Sam, who's uh, who's uh, uh, got an amazing mustache. And we're gonna fuck off now because we're boring ourselves. Bye.